and welcome back to the Assembly Game Development Seminar. It's nice to say this must be the largest audience so far. Uh, our next speaker is Peter Haipa, or Skaven of the Future Crew. That might be the name that most of you have heard about him for the first time. And the uh, presentation is about uh, experiences with Max Payne graphics. Actually, I'd like to add that that title is a bit misleading because it also it's also going to involve something about sound effects, but go okay, on. but it's still the title of the presentation. Yeah. Please welcome Peter Haipa. Thank you, thank you. Okay, first off, hands up. How many of you have played Max Payne? Ooh, great. Okay, so I don't have to explain everything about it. So, um, okay, let's go on. Um, the main idea of this presentation is not going to be a tutorial or anything. I'm not going to give you away any of my super trade secrets. It's rather it's going to be a light-hearted look behind the scenes of what, what happened when I did my work and stuff. So maybe it'll give you some helpful tips. Anyway, so what did I do for Max Payne? Officially, I'm titled as a graphic artist, but in my case, it's included a whole bunch of stuff. I did particle effects, you know, those fires, explosions, snowstorms, and I did the sound effects you hear in the game, and I did character and level textures and character animation. So it's a whole bunch of stuff, and that's exactly what I'm going to show you here. Let's go first to particles. Um, well, that's the title screen. Uh, first off, uh, in general about the particle effects, the game con contains about 282 unique particle effects, and it's a whole ra range of different effects, ranging from candle flames to snowstorms, all the fires, smokes, explosions, just like I said. Uh, the particle effects were done uh, on demand, when the level designers were working on levels, they had like, for example, they had this sewer that had steam coming out of it, and they asked me to do this certain effect that the steam should rise about two meters high, and, and I did that for them, and then it was plugged into the database and so on. And all the effects were created with particle effects. Uh, it's the tool we created ourselves, uh, and it's, I, I'd say it's quite powerful. And the good thing about making your own tools is that if you need some extra features for the tool, you can add them yourself instead of having to whine to the developer of some commercial package to add the feature. Now, the one, one of the good examples of the particle effects is the muzzle flash. What, uh, the Max Payne had a lot of gunfire in it, and what would the guns be without muzzle flashes? Let me show you how the muzzle flash started off at first. I have to launch particle effects. Unfortunately, I cannot have it running in the background because it uses a lot of CPU and slows the computer down, so I have to launch it right here. Okay, let's open the muzzle flash. Here's the original muzzle flash we had in the game. It looks quite okay. It looks volumetric from any directions. But it, when it started, to, it turns out that we were going to have a lot of slow motion in the game. So if we switch this editor into extreme slow motion, you can start seeing how the, how the effect was created. You have a stream of particles coming out, and the flames, they grow, and then they shrink. And that's what gives the muzzle flash its characteristic shape. But it's also a problem because, you know, muzzle flash, it's sort of an explosion, a controlled explosion. And explosions, they don't shrink. So in slow motion, this would have looked a bit stupid. And actually, at first, we had no way to fix this. This was the only good way to do a muzzle flash. But then later on, this particle editor got an extra feature called emission di direction graphs. Uh, first off, you know, the, when the particles get emitted from the muzzle, they come out at a certain velocity. And this velocity they ca came out of the emitter, it, it, at first it was uh, constant. You couldn't change it at all. It always was the same. But later on, we implemented these dire direction graphs. And if you change the graph now, in the beginning, we could have the particles coming out very fast, and later on, they could come out slowly. Now, if, well, that wasn't such a big change. Let's give it a really wild change. Now, if you can see the, oh, that's the wrong emitter, sorry. <laughs> I was supposed to be tweaking this emitter here. Okay, now let's switch it again. Let's do some change here. And as you can see, the particles start out coming very fast, and then they 
go slower. Now, it doesn't look like a muzzle flash anymore, but it gives you an idea what the emission velocity crap does. They come out fast at first, and then the later particles come out slowly. And that's exactly what, we, what I used to fix the muzzle flash. Here's the new version of the muzzle flash. Let me show you. So instead of emitting the particles, well, in, in normal speed, it looks almost the same. But if you, again, we switch into extreme slow motion, what you can see is that we first uh, emit small particles that move fast and then large particles that travel slowly. And now it looks much nicer in slow motion. It looks like an actu actual explosion in slow motion. What I also added was, was these sudden blasts of smoke coming out of the gun. Because when I, I, if you watch the news, you can see some terrorist firing his Kalashnikov. You can see those blasts of smoke coming out of the gun. And I tried to emulate those with these quick blasts of smoke coming out of the gun. And it gives a much better impression. So that's how the muzzle flash evolved. Let's try really extreme slow motion. OK, the flames start coming out very slowly. Hmm, this might be a bit boring. You don't want to go, go through this. <sighs> Let's move on with the presentation. Oh. All right. Here's the conclusion. The slow motion shrinkage problem, as I just explained, it was solved by the emission velocity graphs. Okay, that was the only point I had there, actually. <laughs> okay, the second thing about action movies is explosions. Action movies have a lot of them, and they need, if, you're, if it's an action game, you must have very good explosions. <sighs> and now, and usually if you have an action games, they have explosions that don't look quite good. They usually look like this. And can you tell what the problem is with this explosion? Sure, it has a very nice bitmap sequence there. It has a bunch of these explosions, but first off, it's way too slow. It's, it could be a very huge explosion, but, well, we didn't have those in our game. And secondly, it, all these explosions, they look the same. They, they're identical. There's a bunch of identical explosions in a group, and it doesn't look very good. So what should you do to make this look better? Let me show you a better example. Kaboom! Now oh, that's much more like it. So what's the difference? First off, the actual flame is it's very fast. It disappe disappears quite quickly. And then if you look very closely, you can see that there's this shock wave that expands out of the explosion, this very lightly colored gray area. If, you, if I switch to pause, you can see it. Is it actually visible on the big screen? Actually, I'm not sure. Let's see if you can actually notice it. Yeah, can you notice it? It's very faint shockwave expanding. It looks better on the screen, but anyway. And then there's this cloud of smoke that lingers there after the explosion. Oh, it looks like that's also hardly visible. Let's increase its opacity a little. Oh, it's already almost in full opacity. Well, whatever. <laughs> okay, again in slow motion. The other major difference you can see here that now the explosion bitmaps, these billowing things here. They're not identical. They're mirrored and they're randomly rotated. And they also have a bit different lifetime. So some of them disappear a bit before the others. And that's what gives the explosion a lot of variety. It looks different every time. So what are the most important points about explosions? First off, a good bitmap sequence alone isn't enough. You have to use it the right way. I'm, I'm see, in too many games I have seen these very, very good-looking explosions as bitmaps, but they're way too slow. They don't feel like violent explosions. An explosion is supposed to be a short, violent event. It should feel like it. And if it's too slow, it just feels like you could run away from it. Well, they actually do that in action movies, but... <laughs> okay, the bitmap random variation is essential. If you have, you're going to show a bunch of bitmaps, they, if they all look identical, it looks stupid. They have to be rotated and flipped. So if your game engine has a particle system that does not support this feature, you should pester your coders, coders and drive them crazy until they implement that into their engine. And that expanding shock wave, well, I hope you noticed it, but it helps to give the explosion some extra punch. And the flames part, the bright part of the explosion, actually vanishes quite quickly, but the smoke should linger for a while. 
Okay, next thing, fireballs and flames. We have Max here in flames. He's not looking very, but he's bothered much by it. Okay, um, back to particle effects. Let's show you a basic fire effect at first. Uh, I may sound like I'm patting myself on the back here, but many game reviewers said that the fires in Max Payne look very good. And the secret is that it's actually real fire. We used real flames. And to demonstrate that, let me show you... Actually, I'm going to show you another thing first, because the film I'm going to show you has involves these both. Here's the Molotov cocktail explosions. If you've been throwing those Molotov cocktails around, you have seen this, haven't you? And there you can see this fireball thing here. That's also real footage. It's an actual explosion as a video clip. And it was extracted into a particle bitmap and used here. But they, these tend to be a bit tricky. Let me show you what's, what the, what's the tricky part. Movies. You see, um, the footage usually doesn't work in a very ideal way for <laughs> particles. Particles shouldn't use too much memory. And for example, if you have this fireball explosion, in the footage the fireball keeps rising. Well, I'll show you the movie, you'll get the idea. Oh, sorry, I should switch to full screen like that. Now you should be able to see it. Sorry. So we have had this footage of an explosion, and I used the 3D Studio Max camera to track the fireball and render it as a particle bitmap. Let's show it again once more. So in the bitmap sequence, you have the explosion pretty much stationary. Otherwise, you would have this huge square bitmap with most of it unused, and that doesn't make any sense. And when, you, when you're tracking the... If, if, if it's stationary within the particle, you can then as, uh, give it different gravity values to have it rise at different speeds for different purposes. Very handy. Okay, the flames were actually made the very same way. We had a piece of footage featuring real flames. And again, we used, we, I captured individual flames from this fire footage and used a camera to track them. And that's how they were caught. And these were used in the fire effect. It gives a very nice realistic effect. <coughs> okay, on with the show. More of the story. Real fire footage gives great results, but it can get a bit tricky to get put it into good use. Oops, sorry. That's the next topic already. <laughs> yeah, sound effects. That's the other thing I made for the game. 1331 sound files. I, I think I made pretty much all of them, including all the dialogue and sound effects. But the music and, uh, was made by uh, Valtari, the Finnish band, two members from Valtari, Kartsu Hatakka and Kimmo Kajasto. Okay, for the sound effects we used, uh, instead of doing our own foley, I mean, I could have taken a microphone and a dead recorder and go running in the woods to record different sound effects. But it, it can be a very mu a great amount of work. And we had to produce this game in a limited time frame, which was when it's done. <laughs> anyway, uh, buying commercial sound effect libraries can give very good results. They're a bit expensive, but they're very much worth the money because you don't have to do your own Foley then. And all, all these sound effect libraries, including General 6000 and various others, they were copied into this one huge hard drive which was in our local network. So I, could ha I had this huge database of sound effects and I could actually perform searches through it. I, if I needed a sound of footsteps, I just t typed footsteps as the search word and it find, found me all the footsteps sound effects that were available. And it made, it, it made the process very fast. Uh, the main tools I used were Vegas Audio and SoundForge. Everybody knows SoundForge is the basic sample editor. You can tweak sounds with it. Vegas Audio, it's a multi-track sample editor, which is non-destructive. So you can have multiple channels, you can slap sounds together, you can use pieces of sounds and all that. And it does it all non-destructively. So you, it actually just links to the files that are in the network. 
And if you save the hundreds of different project files, it only saves the links to the files, so you don't get these huge files filling your, up your hard drive. The project files are actually very small, and you can plug them with different effects, and you can put, put fades and envelopes and all that. It's a, it's a godsend. It was a very good pro purchase we made. Right, and sound effects, they do make a difference. Can you hear the difference? Uh, I'm going to play you uh, one graphic novel sequence from Max Payne. And first off, you're going to hear it without sound effects, or it only has dialogue and a couple of very basic sound effects. And if you now listen to it, and you may notice how plain it may sound. Where's the sound, by the way? Where's the computer audio? Um, need some help here, PC audio. It's on, okay. Let's try again. Vinny got needy. Just the man I've been killing to see. Pain? Freaking fed! I knew from day one there was something screwy about you! What do you think you're doing? You're a freaking cop! You ain't got squat on us! You can't just come in here waving your peace like it meant something! <laughs> yeah! Oh my god! Oh god, you shot me! Ah! You're dead, Pain! What the hell are you waiting for, you apes? Kill him! Kill him! With pleasure, boss. Gagnetti bailed. I made like Chaoyun fat. Okay, the thing here is that um, I could have done the sounds for the graphic novels like this. If I had used only SoundForge, this is how I would have done it. But it sounds kind of dull. But uh, when we, uh, we bought Vegas Audio, I thought that, hey, I could put all these sound effects into the game. All the footsteps, all the rustle of the leather jacket and all that. And I th decided to give it a try, and I thought it sounded much better, so I decided to do it to all the graphic novels. Vinny got needy. Just the man I've been killing to see. Pain? Freaking fed! I knew from day one there was something screwy about you! What do you think you're doing? You're a freaking cop! You ain't got squat on us! You can't just come in here waving your peace like it meant something! Oh my god! Oh god, you shot me! Ah! You're dead, Pain! What the hell are you waiting for, you apes? Kill him! Kill him! With pleasure, boss! Got me bailed. I made like Chaoyun fat. Yeah. Can you hear the difference? Alright. Let's move to textures. Again, some nice facts for you. There are 52 individual character skins in the game, and they used about 369 textures. I didn't do all of these, I only did a small part of these. I worked mainly on the faces. And the game also contains hundreds of level textures. They're inside the level files, so unfortunately I can't tell you the exact number, because we couldn't do this quick database search there, but it's a huge number anyway. Almost all these textures were created from photo material. It's a blessing, but it's also a curse. It's uh, quite different from drawing the textures yourself. It gives very realistic results, but it doesn't mean that it's all easy. You have to do some work for it. <sighs> the faces, for example. Here's an example with the face. Okay, again, let's go back to the directory. Let's show you an example. We took, there's one character you have in the game. We took eight photos of him from eight directions. Oh, why is it not ACDC? Sorry, now I have to... Okay, I think I should show it on, you on, to you on PowerPoint. This should give you a pretty good idea. Uh, these eight photos taken from diff sorry, different directions, they were combined into this one cylindrical map. And you can see the mesh outlines here. Uh, this is how they were mapped onto the character. And I have the Photoshop project open right here. So, we took parts of each photo and masked them together like that. If I switch on the different layers, you can see here's the front part. Uh, here's the three-quarter layers like that. And then there's the one-quarter view, side views. Everything done like that. The re rear part of the head, it was first placed in the middle, and then with the offset filter, it was s sent to the edges so that it wraps around, so it tiles seamlessly on the, on the edges of the picture. And then we added some extra layers to cover the hair. You can use polar coordinates on the hair. If you take a picture of the top of the head of the character, you can use polar coordinates to create this edge here. And then some extra stuff for the ne neck. You merge them all together. And then we took different expressions of the character from the front. And 
you can see the difference here. Uh, th this is the basic expression. Actually, all the bad guys in the game have this expression. They're permanently angry. Okay, and when they fire their guns, they look like this. <laughs> if you look very closely at the characters in Max Payne, you can see that they all gr grimace when they fire their guns. It looks a bit silly sometimes, but it gives a nice effect. And okay, when we shoot the bad guy, that's how he ends up looking like. <laughs> right, and this layer also contains the extra parts that were needed for the character. We had this default hand, hand, lay hand texture, and the hand hand's color had to be adjusted so that it matches with the rest of the face. The original texture is colored, colored like this, but some adjustment layers gives it the same tone as the face. And then the face itself had to be adjusted a little. Okay, I guess that's the final texture. Anyway, that's how we're done. Uh, we also have this mesh here. It's overlaid on top. You can use it to t see how it maps onto the character. But um, this template isn't actually very good. The problem was that I didn't know, it, uh, you have to know pixel accurately where to place the ear, where to place the eyes. And this mesh doesn't quite tell you that. I could use this point here as a point of reference. This part of the ear should be roughly at this point. But there still were some inconsistencies between the faces. And it caused a problem that you couldn't switch faces between meshes freely. It had four different character meshes three different 3D meshes, and then you had four different characters. And you could, in theory, you could randomize, switch between them freely. But because there were inconsistencies between the textures, you couldn't, we couldn't do that totally freely. Uh, the moral of the story was you have to create a very good template for that. And we're doing it this time, actually. So we won't have those problems with Max Payne 2. OK. And here's another texture. Oh, OK. Conclusion again. Obviously, the main tool was Adobe Photoshop. And, well, you know all this. Okay, create a good template. It makes your life easier. Here's another good, good trick I learned with Photoshop. Layer effects. You know, there are those quick and easy things. You can put bevel and drop shadows and all that kind of stuff into your textures. And it's kind of corny and kind of lame. But if you use them creatively, you can get, get quite nice results. Uh, in one level in Max Payne, we had this burning restaurant. You had to go through a burning restaurant. And the restaurant, some parts of it were burned, and other parts were intact. And we needed to burn all these textures. And because we used photo material, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't go to a building and photograph it, and then just accidentally have it burned down, and then take <laughs> some more pictures. So these burns, they had to be hand-drawn. So uh, because we had a huge bunch of textures, and they all had to be burned like this. This is the how the texture started. And I created this, this layer style, which let me activate the layer effect. This middle part here has a, some effects in it. Layer style, show all effects. It has two effects in it. It has a drop shadow, and it has an inner glow, a dark inner glow. So if there's a hole in the alpha map, there's a dark area around it that makes it look like it's burned. And the drop shadow makes this part look like it comes a bit apart. Let me show you. When I activate the alpha map for this texture, you can see how burned it looks. Now, if I take a brush tool, for example, a basic brush, and I paint some like this. You can see how the burn marks update themselves like that. This dark outline here, it's the inner glow. And they, you can see that the, let's take a bit sharper brush here. You can see that there's a tiny shadow underneath the, so it looks like a separate layer. There's a layer of paint that's been burning off the concrete. And with these effects, I could quite quickly paint a huge bunch of burnt textures. Uh, custom brush shapes are also very handy because these round blobs look kind of silly. So instead, uh, you use a custom brush shape like that. You can make these very irregular shapes there. Let's increase the spacing a little like that and get the better idea. And use a tablet. Mouse is a very good bad drawing tool. It's like drawing with a brick. Tablets are very handy. And then some additional layers like that. Burn marks painted on top. And voila, you have a burnt wall and you didn't have to take a picture of one. Groovy. Okay, on with the show. Again, the conclusion. While they're often deemed quite corny or lame, they can be very helpful if you use them creatively. Custom brush tips rule. Now, and one, there's an, uh, one more discovery I made when using Photoshop, and it's the high pass filter. Basically, the high pass filter is a very handy way to get rid of these 
dark, blurry areas of detail that cause annoying rep repetition in the texture. You can see that there's this dark area in the texture that repeats over and over and over again. And if you try to use the burn and dodge tools in Photoshop to remove these, it can take you ages and it can drive you crazy. But instead, if you use the high pass filter, it gives this a nice result very quickly. You can still notice some grayness here, but that's much easier to get rid of than those darkness areas. Uh, I actually wrote an entire article about this, and it's in this following URL. So well, it's a bit long and complicated URL, so if you want to write it down, I can give you the time now. And I can put this screen back on after the presentation if you want, want to write down the URL. Anyway, high pass filter was a a very helpful discovery for me, and it was a, such a eureka that <laughs> made my life easier. Okay, now let's move on to character animation. Back then, motion capture, it was difficult and expensive. It cost a fortune, and there actually weren't any motion capture studios in Finland back then when we started making the game. The nearest one was in Sweden, and if the motion capture studio is very far away, it can get very tricky. You have to travel over there, or you can have to email them, and the project can get complicated. And character studio was another thing. It wasn't back then. It wasn't quite the powerful tool it is today. Today it's excellent. It's a very powerful and useful tool. But back then it was very hard to use and difficult to learn. So instead of using character studio on motion capture, we created this basic guy, basic hierarchy skeleton here, and we used that to animate the characters. That's Max Payne. That's how his skeleton looks. His skeleton looks like. Okay, come on, Max. Say hi to the audience. Hello. <laughs> and animating the characters was, boy, that was a lot of work. Max Payne contains 379 individual character animations. And they were all hand animated, including the leather jacket. So uh, you, you can understand how why t making the game took so long. <laughs> we used video material for reference, both homemade footage and action movies. And speaking of video material, boy, do I have something to show you. Here's the first clip, just the basics. Max Payne behind the scenes. There's no sound, sorry about that, but you get the idea. That's Ossi Turpen, and that's our weapon, weapon specialist. He performed these stunts for us. And I, when I was animating the characters, I had this a, a video recorder in my room on my desk, and I had a television screen, and I just watched this video s s uh, footage, and then I animated the characters accordingly. That's Sam Lake, <laughs> our script writer. <laughs> and it, you can see the flicker here. The videotape got quite worn because we used it a lot. Now, here's a very c concrete example of, you know, you've seen that move in the game, haven't you? Here's how it works. I didn't rotoscope. I didn't put the video footage behind uh, into the 3D scene. I just looked at it on the screen. It's kind of like life drawing. You see what kind of pose the character is in, and then you bend the, your 3D character in the same pose, and then you start adjusting the timing. OK, what comes to the particle effects? We went to a firing range, and we fired some guns over there. And that actually helped me with the animation. I saw how the gun jerks when it fires, and I also saw, saw these expanding smoke clouds coming out of the guns. That's Ossi again. That's, he's the weapons guy. That's Ossi's black powder revolver. He actually has an antique black powder revolver. <laughs> and it was great. It, uh, we, I actually used this for inspiration when making the sword of shotgun. It gives a lot of smoke and stuff. Great gun. And very noisy as well. <laughs> OK. Now, uh, since. We used video material. I thought that, well, why not? We used, shot our own stuff. But then I saw a lot of different action movies that also had very cool sequences in them. And I thought that, hey, why not? Why don't I take some sequences from some action movies as well? How many of you have seen John Woo's Hard Boiled? OK. Now, do you remember this scene? Oh, sorry. Let me put it full screen again. Can you see the guy falling over? You may have seen that in the game. Let's show it again. So indeed, we have been inspired by action movies. Here's another one. Pause, full screen.
So I don't know if this breaks the copyright laws or anything, <laughs> but it certainly was very inspiring. Okay, uh, now that since we did shoot our own uh, video footage, it didn't always go perfectly. Oh, well, let me show you something else first. Uh, here's um, when, when we're making the uh, Molotov cocktail effects, I saw this one marvelous clip on Tosi TV, and I want to show it to you. It might be a bit shocking, but I hope you can stomach it. It doesn't and, work. Sorry, full screen again. It doesn't work. A Molotov cocktail explodes in flames, setting one man on fire. He escapes the flames of that fire. He won't escape the next. Oh dear. This is from Reality TV America. And Tosi TV showed it a bit later on. Fellow workers finally put the flames out and the man looks okay. But he has second and uh, first and second degree burns. Uh, it was quite inspiring when I was making the character animations and the particle effects for the Molotov cocktail. So yes, violence on TV can result to viol uh, can cause violence in video games. <laughs> okay, now since we shot our own footage, it didn't always go perfectly. Here are some examples. That's Ossi. He's trying to do this cool spin. Doesn't quite work. Okay, and then he's having a great deal of trouble doing this ukemi in the other direction with his gun in his hand. Oh, it doesn't quite work. Okay, Sam Lake is trying to reload his weapon. Uh, uh. Oh dear, try again, try again. Ah, uh, oh man, try, try again. <laughs> right. Okay, and that's it. Now, if you have any questions that are not related to Max Payne 2, I'll be more than glad to answer them. Yes? Uh, the bad guy textures, I think they were 256 pixels by 256. And uh, they, we had, I don't remember the exact number, but I think there was about 30 or 40 of them. Uh, we uh, just, we, our circle of friends, we had some American people visiting us. Whenever they came, we just grabbed them and took them into the photo studio and took their pictures. So you see, you can actually see some people from the 3D manufacturers in the game. You can, Actually, there was there were three three textures per one character. There was the face texture, then there was the upper body texture. It contained the jacket and the sleeves, but the hands were actually in the face texture. And then there were the legs that it contains the trousers and the shoes. Okay, anything else? Yes. Sorry, can you speak up? Uh, what kind of uh, the question was what kind of camera did we use? We used the Nikon Coolpix 900 and later 950. Uh, it's uh, not that expensive, but it's a very good camera. And one handy thing about it is that you can actually swivel the lens of it, so you can have it, hold it above your head and you can watch the screen and still take the picture facing forwards. It's very handy for different perspectives. All right, anything else? Yes? That guy? That's Sam Lake. He's our script writer. Oh. He actually starred in the graphic novels and he, he was used as the texture of the hero. Anything else? Okay, I guess that's it then. I sincerely hope this show has been helpful and interesting. Thank you.